For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet or connect with yet, my name is Lindsay Broadhead. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs here at the Toronto Region Board of Trade. So I'm so glad to kick off our first panel discussion of the day, a, a subject all about the topic of aviation. It's clear to everyone that these past two years have been uniquely challenging for the aviation industry. It has taken an incredible leadership role in ensuring our region continued and continues to receive critical goods needed during the pandemic. Of course, tourism and business travel took a huge hit and that continues to impact the global, global movement of goods. But at the same time, the movement of goods, much of which is by air, was also disrupted. We continue to talk about supply chain problems with cargo backlogs and logis logistics issues. As a result, the industry has been attempting to rapidly adapt and adjust. Now, as the tone of the public conversation around COVID turns to living with the virus over the long term, many players within the space are considering what the future of aviation might look like. This is particularly important um, for our region to answer. The visitor business economy is a major economic boon for us, generating 11 billion for the region in 2019 alone. Much of that came from business travel, people coming here for major conferences to sign big deals, or even just an afternoon of meetings. On that, we're keenly interested in when you, as an audience of the region's businesses and organizations, plan to resume the work trips that constitute this business travel. I invite you all to answer a poll, which you can find on the right side of your screen, just beside the questions tab. The poll asks, when do you expect to resume your business travel to pre-pandemic levels? And I'll be sharing the results at the end of this session. While you go answer the poll, I'll introduce our next speaker, someone who I know is eager for a more robust return of the business, travel and other travelers as well, John Thomas, the CEO of Connect Airlines. John is highly respected, a value creating and innovation oriented global aviation leader with decades of hands-on experience. He launched his first regional airline in Australia during the 1970s, and today is a trusted partner and senior advisor to many of the world's leading airlines. Welcome, John. Thank you for being here, and over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. The Toronto Region Board of Trade and President uh, Jan De Silva for the opportunity to speak here today, and congratulations for the board uh, for hosting this important event, uh, given the challenges that we all have uh, facing our, ourselves. Uh, I'm John Thomas, the CEO of Walsing Matilda, uh, and we're the operator of Connect Airlines. Walsing Matilda is a Boston-based jet charter operator in the process of getting our license to fly scheduled and non-scheduled services under the Connect Airline brands. And we identified Toronto long before the pandemic as a business opportunity to serve the region's business community and leisure travellers, specifically through Billy Bishop Airport. And despite the pandemic, which, as we all know, has lasted a lot longer than we all thought possible, um, we still believe there's significant demand to, uh, to bring more travellers to Toronto. Uh, and so we'll, we, too, will be very keen on Lindsay's survey in finding out uh, when people think that their travel will be returning to normal. But despite, um, but despite all this, as I say, we think there is um, a lot of demand for, uh, for services uh, to Toronto. Our plan pending FAA and Transport Canada approval will begin US Canada transporter services this spring. Initially, we will connect travellers with flights between Toronto and Philadelphia and Toronto and Chicago O'Hare's airport, thus expanding the airport served uh, today from Billy Bishop. Our plan is to expand services to and from additional US centres subject to attaining more slots at Billy Bishop Airport. And as a traveller benefit, we plan to enhance the passenger experience and the perception of flying on a turboprop aircraft. Additionally, we will be partnering with world leading airlines and frequent flyer programs, again, to give greater choice uh, and, and utility to, uh, to our customers. And I look forward to announcing some of these initiatives in the coming weeks and months. So I'm asked all the time, why Toronto and why Billy Bishop? I know and you know that Billy Bishop is a vital economic and quality of life gateway for Toronto and in demand from US traveller. It's a win-win. Access to US markets has long been a massive competitive advantage for Toronto. And Toronto is very fortunate to have two complementary airports with Pearson being a highly successful hub 
and long haul airport with Billy Bishop focused on short haul point to point passengers. Um, and given the greater the great the the incredible convenience that Billy Bishop has, obviously being in downtown Toronto. Um, we believe that uh, Billy Bishop currently is underutilised versus the number of visitor economy uh, events, attractions and accommodations in the Toronto centre. We're also aware and very sensitive to the airport's history and connection to the Toronto waterfront community. Connect will open up more markets, bringing additional business and leisure travellers to the city. We will expect this will support jobs and economic growth in Toronto. And we are working with the, the business community, the waterfront community and other stakeholders to empower the airport's benefits to all. And from day one, our service will do all of this in an environmentally friendly way. We are committed to reducing emissions today through the wonderful Canadian built Dash 8400 airplane uh, and eliminating all CO2 emissions soon with new hydrogen technology. Our goal, what drives us, is to become the first zero emission airline in the US. Our Project Zero will be a true differentiator between Connect and other airlines. In December last, we announced a partnership with Universal Hydrogen. Together with Universal Hydrogen, by 2025, we expect to begin, begin flying zero emission hydrogen fueled airplanes for passenger services into Billy Bishop Airport. Connect's Project Zero provides a tangible plan from, re from reduced to zero emissions commercial air travel. We are on the leading edge of smarter, greener travel with zero emissions and zero carbon technology adoption. With the planes we fly, the technology we use and the operations we run, Connect will deliver a quieter, cleaner and healthier travel experience. We are very, ex we are very excited to serve this market. Thank you all for being here today. And now I look forward to hearing from more about the aviation's recovery and economic contributions. To lead us through that, let me turn to Andrew Weir, the executive, executive vice president of Destination Toronto. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, John. Um, I love the passion that you you talk about Toronto and the, the opportunity of Toronto and the importance of of the visitor economy and the opportunity that we have to maximize the business travel opportunity in the city. So um, I also love to see the livery on the on the aircraft. You can see it behind you on the screen. It uh, looks wonderful, and I look forward to seeing that uh, uh, coming to and from uh, Billy Bishop very soon. Uh, thank you also to the Board of Trade for including uh, not only me this morning, but uh, but the conversation about the visitor economy and the broader conversation about aviation. I know uh, uh, this is an important session. This is an important summit overall today, and clearly the aviation session is an important component of that. In my line of work, uh, attracting leisure events, uh, leisure travelers, and business events to the city, when you look at what makes a destination competitive, access is right at the top of the list. And I know the same is, is very much true for the dozens of other sectors that are represented in our, our virtual room today. Access is everything. And for the Toronto region, it was a genuine competitive advantage. Uh, you've heard many of the stats before. Pearson is the sixth most, con most connected airport in the world. Not long before the pandemic, we were doing a study, you know, doing our own um, investigation into certain routes and frequencies and access so that we can promote the, the access of Toronto. Remember, this is before pandemic. Um, but if we were together, I'd say, does anyone want to guess? But since I'll just tell you, we were looking at certain routes. Um, the number of planes from the number of flights from New York's three airports to Toronto's two airports every day is 71. Think about that. 71 planes take off every day in New York and land here in Toronto. Presumably 71 go the other way, but we, again, in, <laughs> as a visitor economy, we focus more on the ones that come this way. Uh, but it's a staggering advantage. And when you think about uh, when we work with meeting planners, one reason that they choose Toronto is because their delegates can get here. Uh, we have to have all the other advantages, of course. You've got to have all the other infrastructure that's needed to make that, that event work and to be compelling as a leisure destination. But at the end of the day, access is what makes it possible. The movement of goods and people in particular make that possible. So then when we look at the damage that's been done to the aviation sector uh, over the course of the pandemic and the road back, that level of access and competitive advantage, uh, there is reason to be both very daunted but also optimistic. Um, I think we can all agree it's not just a matter of time restarting this engine, the movement of people and goods, uh, and the massive infrastructure needed to sustain and grow it uh, needs purposeful action and strategies. And that's part of what we're here to talk about today. So I'm looking forward to the discussion in a moment. We'll dig into both sides of what's next, the challenges, uh, the challenges of the moment, but also the opportunity to regain and perhaps even gain a new, uh, gain further competitive advantage through our access and through our aviation. 
one reason to be optimistic is because of the tremendous leadership we have in our aviation sector. And I'm so pleased to share a screen today uh, with a number of them. So let me introduce our, our wonderful panel this morning. First, I'm gonna introduce Jennifer Quinn, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Newport Aviation, which is the owner and operator of the terminal at Billy Bishop Airport. Since opening in 2003, Billy Bishop has grown to become one of the 10 busiest airports in Canada, acting as a vital touch point for travelers coming right into downtown Toronto. They've opened this past September. Uh, I flew out of Billy Bishop in, uh, in the fall. It was my, my return to flight came uh, at Billy Bishop, and uh, it was wonderful to see a, uh, an active, buzzing terminal as we'd seen before. Uh, and I know uh, Jennifer and the team are very focused on, on recovery and what comes next. Next on our panel is David Rowe, Managing Director of Government and Community Relations at Air Canada. Prior to the pandemic, Air Canada has dramatically increased destinations served by Toronto Pearson, uh, helping transform Toronto and Pearson in particular into a global hub, improving Canada's international competitiveness. And likewise, Air Canada is looking to reclaim much of that pandemic related lost ground in the months and years ahead. We have with us Laurie McKee, Director of Public Affairs and Stakeholder Relations of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, the GTAA, or the operator of Pearson. Pearson is our region's gateway to the world, and it is also the center of one of the, the country's most, impo the most important employment zones. Uh, I know the Board of Trade has been very uh, active on, on the further development, working closely with GTAA and partners in that region uh, and developing that employment zone. Uh, so I know Laurie will have some comments about, about that opportunity as well. And finally, Andy Gibbons. Andy is the Vice President of Government Relations and Regulatory Affairs at WestJet. WestJet has made significant, uh, a significant commitment to building its increasingly global network through Toronto, uh, which has been very important. And like this whole industry has been forced to rethink what innovation means in a, in a pandemic world. So welcome to all of our, all of our panelists. We're going to get the conversation started. I will sort of remind everyone that we will, um, we'll start with a few questions that we've uh, give everyone a chance. I'll kind of go to each one of the panelists for a, a question to get things started. Let them say good morning um, and uh, talk about a specific issue, a specific facet of this this conversation. Uh, then we'll open it up a bit more broadly. But this is you know this is your advance warning, audience. We are coming to you. We are we've got a good long time for this session. We've got an hour this morning, um, so we're coming to you. We're counting on uh, on some good input and uh, and discussion. So please. Uh, Think up those questions. You've heard the instructions about how to how to serve those up to us, and we'll be watching closely for them. So, Jennifer, let me start with you, if I could. Billy Bishop has been uh, in the planning phase of a preclearance facility. So, what what would preclearance mean as um, as, a, as enabling our role as a gateway city, and and particularly for Billy Bishop as a gateway airport to the major American business centers? Right. Well, thanks, Andrew, for the question, and thanks for having me today on the panel. Uh, yes, planning for preclearance is well underway, and we're certainly keen to see this project implemented. You know, preclearance would uh, obviously provide direct access to one of our largest trading partners, increase that connectivity to the key U.S. markets, and not just for businesses we've talked about, but also in support of the tourism economy. And as a gateway, preclearance at Billy Bishop would facilitate deepening those trade relationships and increasing jobs on both sides of the border. You know, pre-COVID, uh, Billy Bishop was the sixth busiest Canadian airport serving the U.S. And in fact, in the time since restart from September to December this past year, we were the fifth largest in terms of passenger traffic uh, to the U.S. And when we look ahead to recovery, we do believe that the future growth and demand at Billy Bishop is going to come from the U.S. market. And I think you heard John speak about that just earlier as well. And pre-clearance facility is an important investment that we need to be able to make now to adequately serve this demand in the future and open up opportunities for new connections and new destinations like LaGuardia in New York. Uh, we also believe delivery of pre-clearance is going to have a strong economic impact for our region, and it's going to be an important part of our economic recovery story. We had recently commissioned a study that looked at the future economic impact potential of the airport. And what we, uh, what we discovered was that, you know, with preclearance and looking ahead a couple of years, the GDP impact is expected to grow from $2 billion to nearly $5 billion. We expect more than 1,000 new on-site jobs could be created, with a much more significant impact across the broader economy. Annual direct tax revenues from on-site activities could increase by 50%. You know, we think these figures are quite compelling, and we know there's a lot of support for the project. We had also recently conducted a poll where we uh, heard from 85% of Torontonians who said they were supportive of preclearance at Billy Bishop. And we know there's huge benefits too for the tourism economy. We've received vocal support from organizations like the Greater Toronto Hotels Association, TAIO, and TIAP. 
And Newport Aviation has invested significantly in the terminal uh, since we purchased the asset. And we, we do believe Billy Bishop Airport is an important public asset. And we're definitely excited to get moving with this project. So thanks, Andrew. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, David, let me go to uh, go to you next. And, and just let's focus on the global network that, that Air Canada has been building through Pearson. Um, you know, the, uh, something that we've worked on with Air Canada over the years, is that not only do people fly here, but they fly through here. And that's important. You know, you'd think, again, you know, as, as someone charged with helping bring people to the destination, we're focused on the, the flights that the people that, that choose Toronto, but flying through Toronto, that global network is important as well because it leads to the viability of routes. It makes many, many more routes, particularly through um, feeder markets like in the U.S., uh, more viable and, and they, that wouldn't, otherwise wouldn't be available. So it's a huge advantage that our region has enjoyed competitively. Um, and I know that's been been challenged over the last number of months. So um, how are you approaching that challenge? Uh, you know, very open-ended question here, but how are you approaching the challenge of rebuilding that network, rebuilding the connectivity and, and that, that hub status of, of Air Canada at Pearson? Thanks, uh, Andrew, and thanks for uh, thanks to the Toronto Board of Trade for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to join the panel with my colleagues. Uh, sorry, uh, I have some connectivity problem this morning, so I, I missed a bit of your question. But uh, since we have a good preparation session, I, I think I have an idea of my answer. Uh, no, joking aside, I think when we look uh, at uh, rebuilding connectivity, first we have to stay, take a step back. I think, Andrew, what you said is is right. I mean, we invested a lot uh, in the decade before the pandemic to build global hub in Canada. And Toronto Pearson is for Air Canada our main hub. Uh, and as you mentioned, it, it, it's ranked number six in the most internationally connected airport. Due uh, in, in large fact with the investment that we've made, but also uh, the, the efficient of the connecting facility and the airport and our partnership uh, with a lot of stakeholders. Uh, also to mention that Toronto is very well situated geographically uh, for a hub um, because of the polar route and the access to Asia and Europe that we cannot have with our new modern fleet. And uh, I, I would add as well that the uh, Toronto is one of the most multicultural city in, in, in North America. So this helped a lot to, to, to ease uh, connectivity and traffic. But I would say that, uh, you know, before the pandemic, we operate close to 130 international and U.S. destinations. And we employ uh, more than 10,000 people in the area. Uh, so we are really proud of this, and we're really committed to build this back. Now, the issue that we have, if we compare where we are in terms of industry recovery in Canada versus other country, um, I think one of the main obstacles it remain the travel restriction that remain in place here in Canada versus other countries. As many countries are now easing their border and travel measure, uh, we still have very strict restriction in Canada. For example, the uh, arrival testing that is mandatory for all travelers except travelers coming from the US with isolation that is required pending result. This creates a de facto, de facto quarantine for many travelers. And let's keep in mind that, you know, the, the people who arrive by air in Canada are uh, asymptomatic, fully vaccinated, and have already uh, presented the negative PCR before boarding the aircraft. So you've seen a lot of people in the medical community uh, asking questions about the relevancy of that measure now. Uh, so this is really something that uh, needs to be uh, reviewed. Uh, Pre-departure testing, Canada imposed a uh, PCR pre-departure test requirement, which uh, none of the European countries impose and the U.S. do not impose as well. So I think, you know, uh, we are all committed to build this back together, working with the community, with the airport. But uh, to for the industry to fully recover, we have to look at the travel measure and we have to, in government, you know, have to take an approach that is more uh, risk-based as recommended by the WHS. Thanks, David. There's um, no, a number of things in your response. Well, wait, sure, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's what, there's, there's a few things in your response that we're going to come back to. I don't want the audience to think we're just going to kind of leave those issues. I'm going to move on. I want to just sort of give everyone a chance for a, for a first question, but uh, be assured we will come back to some of those issues. They're clearly, clearly important ones as we consider the recovery and what's needed to, uh, to restart this, this aviation engine. Uh, Laurie, let me come to you next. Um, how has the pandemic forced the GTAA and Toronto Pearson to, to rethink its infrastructure plans specifically? I know 
uh, with, with a facility as complex as as a major global airport, uh, upgrades are constant. So, what are some of the what are some of the highest priorities right now in terms of upgrading facilities and, and the airport? Great, thanks, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. Thanks to Jan and the and the board for your uh, your um, summit today, and really appreciate King Asurma, our Minister of Infrastructure, kicking things off for us. You know, uh, Andrew, absolutely, the infrastructure at Pearson has and the investments we've been able to make and our bottom line have been hugely impacted by by the pandemic. As a not-for-profit, our revenues are tied to passengers. And so as passengers and numbers were impacted by COVID, um, so were our revenues. You know, we, we you know, need to maintain our operations. It's really important to keep for essential movement of goods and, 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 and essential travelers to keep ourselves operating. But we did have to cut back significantly in terms of our own operating expenses. And as a result, you know, we added a billion dollars of debt over the course of the pandemic. Um, our capital program um, that you mentioned, I mean, it's been slashed to about 25% of what it would typically be. So what we do is we contrast that in terms of the competitive landscape that we're operating in and see what's been going on in the United States. You know, the US airports have received almost 20 billion in emergency pandemic funding. Um, just in December, Congress approved 15 billion in infrastructure spending for airport projects. And so, you know, today we're also seeing you, many U.S. airports back to almost 90 plus percent of normal traffic, where we're still sitting at 30 percent of pre-pandemic levels. So our big worry when we think about uh, infrastructure and our ability to invest and maintain uh, the competitive advantage that Canada's had for so many years uh, is our ability to in, invest and, and, and make sure that Canada can compete and grow. Um, Canada was recognized globally for having some of the best airport infrastructure in the world. And that allowed us mm -hmm. to sort of punch above our weight. And, and you talked about that connectivity and the, and the value that a traveler that's maybe not coming into Toronto, but is connecting over Toronto also has. And so that drives foreign investment you know, it drives that tourism visitor economy. Um, and so our worry now is how do we continue to attract uh, that kind of traffic back if we're starting to fall behind in terms of infrastructure? Um, we're looking for government's help and support in terms of removal of the travel restrictions, as David has mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, these requirements are, are hurting travel demand and, and, and it's hard to see that they have the same relevancy in science or in public health that they, they, they once did. Uh, we've got a huge economic zone that Minister Surma mentioned. And so we're looking for those strategic investments to help to make sure that we can continue to connect the airport. There's legacy issues around transit connectivity to Pearson that existed before the pandemic and, and they're not gonna go away. The Eglinton Crosstown West that cuts across the city, looking to see that connecting right up into Pearson. Uh, advancing some studies that are still needed to move that project forward. So great to hear the minister talk about the importance and the commitment of the province to, to make sure that that, that connection happens. Um, we're looking at so that smart investments in green high tech um, uh, infrastructure requirements. You know, we can't just keep building more and more building. We have to think smarter about investments and those transformational types of, of projects that will move us ahead. Uh, and I'll just finish up with an idea that we've been starting to talk about is we pay $100 million a year to the Government of Canada in, in terms of a rent to operate Pearson. That's over 10 years, that's almost a billion dollars. If you think about reinvesting that back into airport infrastructure, the kind of projects that we could advance. So one of the ideas we've put forward is rather than that rent money going into government coffers, let's reinvest it back into airports and see all the good that it can do in terms of making sure Canada, Ontario and Toronto can keep competing in terms of the infrastructure that we have in, in our airports. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, Andy, let me come to you next. Uh, and I wanna talk more about the challenges that airlines face, the challenges that your, your team is facing related to rebuilding customer confidence. What's it gonna to take to get people passengers back onto flights and uh, and therefore enable WestJet and others to increase their service levels and their frequencies. Uh, what, what, what do we need to do to get passengers back on planes? Awesome. Thanks, Andrew, and good morning. Um, I, I just want to start by thanking, you know, everyone on this call, whether it's our corporate accounts or our guests, 
like thank you for sticking with WestJet. In 2022, we'll celebrate 20 years at Toronto Pearson, and we've had 10% growth year over year. So we really have been that challenger brand in Canada, and that growth has been um, been really profound. Uh, in 2019, we flew 11 million seats. <laughs> We have had the largest Q400 order in the history of Downsview with 47. So our investments of growth and growth have really been stimulative. And um, I just want to thank uh, people for supporting our company for 20 years in Toronto. Just as a side note, our founder said that he would never fly east of Winnipeg. <laughs> and here we are today with one out of every five seats in and out of Pearson Airport being on, um, being on a teal a teal covered airplane uh, and also it has allowed is, it has allowed us to partner with Laurie and Toronto Pearson and in, in modernizing T3 and making sure that the region has two world class terminals uh, for two world class airlines and that's something a lot of countries in the world don't have but Canada is blessed to have that so um, I did want to note that at the front end in terms of uh, challenges there, there's really two categories the first category David really I really nailed this section and uh, on all these issues the travel and tourism industry is very united and that is the, the and that is the covid restrictions and then the second category is sort of more structural economic barriers to growth so just a few observations andrew the first barrier i think that is before us is the very unfortunate politicization of travel um, and uh, we won't name names or finger point today. It's a constructive board of trade panel, but um, you know the politicization of travel and travel restrictions is really holding us back today. It is holding us back from moving on from measures that don't that don't uh, that aren't based in science, and has also given different political actors at different times the opportunity to appear to be curbing COVID uh, when that is not the case. And the good news is that our sector has done an amazing job. COVID, the percentage of COVID cases in Canada that actually come from travel has, has been flat and stagnant and has been less than 2% since the beginning of the pandemic. So I think we can safely say now, uh, travel is not and has not been a significant vector of transmission, period. And I think when that is an accepted and understood reality, that will allow us uh, to move forward. The second barrier is the barrier is the treatment of the traveler versus all other segments and consumer activities in the country. There is no mandatory PCR test after you attend a Toronto Raptors game. There is a mandatory PCR test after you take an airplane and land at Toronto Pearson. So why is that? Why is travel singled out and treated as the riskiest activity in Canada when it is not? And I'm not saying the Raptors are, but I'm just saying there is no other activity that has our burden, um, and we accept that burden, and we fought for testing, but that is um, that inequity and the fact that travel is federally regulated but critical to the province and the city um, really is something that we're going to be watching uh, very closely. Um, I have five challenges, but maybe I'll stop at three. Um, the, the third is how the federal government treats the traveler. So aviation is a user pay system. And Lori is right. The government runs a profit center off Toronto travelers, Toronto families, and Ontario families. So we really do think that that is something that needs a very close look. Um, and, and no, this is not a criticism of Via Rail and the importance of rail. But, you know, every passenger on a Via Rail train between Toronto and Montreal is subsidized, um, you know, I believe it's $63 in 2021, while every air traveler is under a user pay model for aviation. I'm not saying that air is more important than rail. That's not really the debate. It's just about how we treat and value the Canadian traveler and, and the economics of travel to make sure that, um, that we're able to bring to life all of these investments that are critical. And maybe I'll sneak one in. All travel is important. You know, we can't have a situation where sun travel is banned and then three months from now, everyone's wondering where the 6 a.m. flight is to Chicago that they love so much and used all the time. You know, it's not a light switch that can move on and off. The mix of traveler and all travel is important and interconnected. And I think that has been lost a little bit during the pandemic. But uh, thanks for having me today. Thanks, Andy. And thank you to all of our panelists for, for getting us warmed up and getting us started. There's, there's a couple of themes that came up that I want to now, now go back to and give others a chance to, uh, to jump in on and comment on. But let me start where, where Andy left off. And, and that is 
you know, this feels like a this feels like a, a an immense road back. It feels like a long road uh, with a lot of steps on it. But let's focus on on immediately. Um, you talked about the politicization of travel. Um, you know, you and David and Number talked about some of the regulations. But let's just focus for a moment on what are the first steps. How do we start any journey? We know we all know the. We all know the expressions, but you know the reality is we need to start. And if we, you know, and let's not be intimidated by the the overwhelming immensity of of the journey ahead of us in terms of coming back. Um, so, you know, question very simply is where do we start? Andy, you talked about the um, removal of some of the uh, some of the regulations and restrictions, but I'd like to get you know as specific as we can. What are some of the the first steps that need to be taken uh, to start to start the road back? Andy, I see you're unmuted, but sure, I thought maybe David sure. also wanted. I'll, I'll let you maybe continue sure. your thoughts, and then maybe David will come to you next, and then our airport colleagues can uh, can jump in after that. But where, where do we start? This oh, process? I'll, sure, I'll, I'll I'll pass the baton, but take it first. I mean, um, you know, Air Canada, uh, WestJet, and the Toronto Airport put out a statement and an open letter from our chief medical officers about two weeks ago to say, why is it that Ontario communities can't access PCR tests while there are stockpiles at Toronto Airport that are being used for asymptomatic travelers? So, um, you know, let's get those tests into Ontario communities and let's not be sending asymptomatic Ontario families into quarantine. So these temporary measures that were put in place for Omicron should be disbanded immediately. Omicron has run laps around travel policy and we just need an environment, that pro a policy environment that reflects that. Uh, and the second category would be the advanced PCR test. The advanced PCR requirement is outdated. It is quickly becoming obsolete because of the nature of the pandemic. And it is, it is the number one barrier to bookings. So, you know, those are sort of the two uh, front and center issues. I'm sure, uh, you know, I'll pass the baton, but Definitely, the temporary measures and reevaluating the advanced PCR are going to um, are, are going to be a very big uh, first step. And accepting the science, accepting the science for most sectors of the economy, the chief medical officers want more restrictions, and the politicians choose less. For travel, it's the opposite. The scientists are actually saying, "Whoa, these measures are really out of whack," and it's the politicians who are putting more on. So maybe we should have the inverse. Well, I don't want to do that to restaurants, but you know, it's just time to accept the science. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in, Andy, and pick up from where you you've left off. Because one of the things we can't forget is the fact that you know Canadians, Trentonians, we all did what was asked of us. You know, we we got vaccinated in large numbers. You know, we stayed home when we were asked to. And you know, I don't think there's any other sector. And I think Andy, this is something you said during your remarks, is that. You know, this is probably the first fully vaccinated sector, you know, between our customers and our workforce. Uh, it's a mandatory vaccination. And so with that in mind, with the science and the data, I mean, we see the arrivals testing data and it pales in comparison. So the science is not supporting it. Our doctors have come out and indicated that arrivals testing just doesn't make sense. You know, I personally traveled the other day and I had my pre-departure test. I'm fully vaccinated before I got on the plane. And, and yet when I arrived at Pearson, I was pulled aside and I did another PCR test. And so how does that make sense today? Um, something else I'd add on is, I mean, we continue to have a travel advisory in this country that is encouraging uh, Canadians not to travel for non-essential reasons. And so with the science that Andy's mentioned and that, that we see, um, why is that still in place? We're watching other countries and we're seeing our medical officers health even provincially coming out almost daily talking about, you know, it's, it's time that we need to start living with this pandemic and this virus and do all the right things and have all the right measures in place to protect public health. Um, but it start to, it start, it's now time to start to peel back the measures. Yeah, it, maybe I'll just add to that too. I mean, I think it, it was said earlier, and I'm certainly interested in the results of the survey, but you know, getting people back to the office, getting people back to travel, whether that's business or leisure, I mean, that's just critically important as an immediate next step. And, you know, I would also just say as sort of a terminal perspective and terminal uh, owner and operator perspective, I think the investment, Laura, you mentioned that earlier, but really needing to sort of focus now on the investment for future sustainability and for mm. future recovery. You know, I, I think that 
we need to start moving moving forward with that now. And that isn't, uh, you know, that's something that can be done in the short term, but I think we'll really feel the impacts longer term as all these restrictions lift and people resume back to uh, different levels of travel. Just uh, maybe if I can add, Andrew, and <clears throat> my colleagues referred to the politicization of travel. I think one thing that the government did during the pandemic that was very uh, informative is uh, they have mandated an expert panel report uh, to make recommendation on testing and border measure. And among these recommendations, uh, they were you know, very uh, recommendation that I would say um, in, in line with what we see in many countries is to move to a more risk-based approach based on the traveler profile. And you, when you read the report, uh, you know, they recommend that fully vaccinated traveler not be subjected to pre-departure tests. And they also recommend that at arrival, you have a, a surveillance system, which is not, uh, which is the system that was put in place before Omicron. So you still, still, you, you still test traveler on a random basis, but there is no isolation requirement. So the government already received uh, from its own appointed expert recommendation as to how implement travel measure uh, with a more uh, science risk-based approach. And that's what other, that, this is exactly what other countries are doing. And we really believe that this is the approach that the King government should take to allow the industry to recover and to give the opportunity to Canadian and Canadian family to travel safely. Andrew, there's a great opinion piece in the Globe and Mail yesterday by Zane Chagla, who's uh, an epidemiologist at McMaster. And the title of the op-ed wasn't time for a recalibration, time for a rethink. The title was travel policy makes no sense, right? And that is, that is just increasingly uh, clear. And I guess fundamentally is, is if this was aerospace or steel or agriculture, uh, you the government's approach would be to absolutely, under all circumstances, not do any unnecessary damage to the sector and to make it as viable as possible at the first available moment. And I'll just observe that doesn't seem to be the case with travel. You know, one of the things, one of the things that we track, of course, is uh, customers' readiness to travel, customers in, in various different markets, their readiness to resume different activities, whether it's eating in a restaurant or flying on a plane. And we've seen a very, very, it's not surprising, but a very strong correlation between government regulations, restrictions, and, and government language, um, and people's comfort with activity. So it's one thing to be restricted and prevented from doing something, but it's also clear that those restrictions create a perception that something is unsafe. Um, and so it's a very linear correlation between the two. Uh, so the language is not only important, you know, as you're, as you're describing, you know, uh, we've heard our, all four of our panelists basically uh, say the same thing about the impact of, of the regulations from slightly different perspectives. But, but what's clear is that those restrictions not only uh, discourage travel, but they sow uncertainty and they sow uh, concern about whether or not people are doing the right thing, whether or not it's okay for their families. And so that, you know, those words matter, that the words that are used to describe activities like travel matter and the language matters, not only from the functional aspects of the restrictions, but from the, um, from how, how they um, elevate or, or, uh, or suppress comfort among travelers. Um, let me just uh, sort of keep going with some of the, uh, some of the themes that came up in, in your comments. And, and a couple of you referred to sustainability initiatives. And let me, let me ask you about that because it's one of the things we've been very aware of as, as travel has been so greatly suppressed over the last two years. Um, there's a greater and, and increasing awareness, of course, of the impact it has. And, and there's, there's, let, let's be honest, there are conversations out there about, you know, should we be resuming travel? Should aviation be part of our future to the same degree as it was in the past? I know there's been enormous steps made in, and a number of you addressed that, in, in how we are, uh, you know, from an aviation standpoint, as well as more broadly in the transportation sector, um, addressing those challenges and working using technology and other strategies. So let me just ask you for a minute. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you about some of those sustainability strategies and how you're kind of leaning into the opportunity, but also very mindful of uh, of the demands of, of customers and consumers now for um, for greater awareness and greater attention and more responsible action on uh, uh, on things like emissions. Um, Lori, maybe I can start with you. You mentioned sustainability earlier, so I'll I'll come back to you on that one. It's it's super important, uh, Andrew, and thanks for raising it again because I think we all are thinking about how we recover. As Jennifer mentioned, it's we're we're going to come out of this, but how do we build back? 
uh, in a way that we're building back better and smarter, you know, using technology, but also thinking about the investments that are made and how they uh, protect uh, uh, climate and our impacts on on our climate and deal with GHGs. We've had a fairly um, progressive and expansive program at the airport to manage our own GHGs and we've set commitments and the industry writ large uh, uh, through airports groups has, has set targets for zero carbon emissions by 2030. And so, um, we're, we're sort of marching down that path and we do so in sort of collaboration with our industry partners because we're kind of we're joined at the hip in terms of you know what the airports has at its uh, uh, ability in terms of what we can do and yet what the aviation sector as a whole needs to, to do. Um, so thinking about our goals for transformational investments, it's through that lens. you know when we think about um, building back, you know it's not just about building bigger buildings. But we need to be thinking about building smarter, more technological, greener buildings uh, that can move efficiently. We use technology that have ways to process people efficiently and faster and, and get them through facilities in seamless, touchless, healthy ways. Uh, we think about the role that transit can play and, and how we can uh, deal with the congestion challenges that exist around the roads, around the airport, what that does in terms of um, bringing people to the airport for good jobs and the airport employment zone, what it does to help support travelers getting to the airport, uh, what it does to help goods movement, because there's a huge component of goods movement that aviation supports. 70% of cargo is moving in the underbelly of passenger aircraft. And we've seen cargo increases over the course of the pandemic as that essential movement has had to happen. So how can we leverage some smart investments in transit to help to move goods and deal with those congestion challenges around the airport? So there's some of the ideas and things that we're thinking about in terms of how we think about uh, commitments. There's lots of um, technology that's sort of on the forefront that, that the industry is looking at as well. And I'm sure Andy and, and David can talk about those more specifically in terms of aircraft. Thanks, uh, Laurie, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> Andrew, uh, to your question, you know, of course, sustainability is a very important issue, but I think the, the real question is not if we build back, is how we build back. Definitely, we need to build back uh, the travel and tourism economy. You know, as Laurie said, it's instrumental not only to the movement of good, it's instrumental for families to see each other, uh, for, uh, for people to travel and to see other countries. And it's also instrumental to our uh, global economy and to our Canadian economy. Uh, you know, Canada is a, is a country with the leading aerospace industry. Uh, so, you know, building back the industry is also important to sustain thousands of jobs across the country. Uh, and as my colleague Laurie say, I think what's important is how we build back. At Air Canada, we have over the last decade, while growing, uh, modernized our fleet with more fuel efficient aircraft. We've have also set ambitious goal of uh, GHC sorry, reduction. Uh, we want to be net zero by 2050 with an interim goal to be uh, down by 20% um, by 2030, by 2030, sorry. Uh, so I think it's really important that we work together to achieve this goal. Uh, a key element of, of, of this objective for us is the use of a sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we have announced investment of 50 million to develop more supply in the country. And I think that's an industry where government should, you know, talk with the industry. And I know there is program, but, you know, talk with the industry and the whole supply chain to develop Canadian solution for the supply of sustainable aviation fuel. And we're happy to be a partner in to this discussion. Yeah, I'm... Sorry, Jennifer. No, it's okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay, um, I think one of the key things here is uh, Andrew will be the role will be to watch and observe and be engaged on the role of government on the sustainability path versus the role of industry. You know, industry is across the world working for a sustainable alternative fuel option. You know, for our guests and for our communities, and when we are profitable, we have the ability to buy more fuel efficient aircraft that is sometimes ten. 15% mule fuel efficient. So industry will have the answers and the commitment here. What we do need to avoid is government measures that uh, attempt to dissuade people from flying 
or punish frequent travelers. Uh, these kinds of measures are are not going to get the industry where it needs to be, and and they will because their goal is to do this is to get less people to fly. And I don't think anyone on this at the summit wants less planes at Billy Bishop or Toronto Pearson or anywhere. We need more and more global connectivity, but we have a shared commitment to to getting that alternative fuel in place, which is going to be the game changer. Sorry, Jennifer. No, no, thanks. Uh, yeah, I echo a lot of the statements that have been made. And, you know, as we talk about, you need to continue the focus on environmental sustainability, but also on supporting the communities in which we operate. You know, I'm proud to work at an airport and Ports Toronto taking the lead, maintaining an open dialogue with the local residents, being committed to our motto of being a cleaner, greener and quieter airport. And there's been a lot of initiatives and, you know, as, as was mentioned before, sort of within your own control, but then how do we work together as an industry? And, you know, Ports Toronto, for example, underwent an electrification of their uh, ferries. The ferry is one of the ways in which, you know, people get to the island airport. And we're actively looking at doing the same for our shuttle service. You know, the airport right now is operating on 100% green energy through Bullfrog and have been since uh, 2010. When we think about, you know, future capital projects and capital investments like U.S. preclearance, you know, we will be building that with sustainable construction practices in mind, uh, you know, continuing to invest in, in noise mitigation. So, you know, there's stuff that has been done. There's certainly more we can and, and will do. And I think, you know, as an industry, just continuing that focus on sustainability and investing in our communities is going to be critical. Um, this, thank you for that. I'm going to go to this is audience. This is your warning. <laughs> I'm coming to you next. We've got lots of time left. So uh, I've seen a few questions start to come in already and uh, please do, uh, you know, serve up a few more for our, uh, our panelists here. You've got them in front of you. Take advantage of them while they're here and uh, while they're on stage here. Um, I'm going to put one more question and then we'll, we'll go to more of the, uh, the questions coming in from the room. And, and again, a couple of you alluded to this uh, just before I was about to ask it, and that is about, about cargo and freight. You know, we, we did a lot of conversation about supply chain disruptions and, and the challenges in rebuilding those. So um, again, you started to talk about this, but maybe we can resume some of that conversation as it relates to um, how, how is the sector working to support and, and help rebuild that that aspect of the economy that you know, there's there so much conversation about right now, so many concerns about uh, the setbacks in supply chain and uh, and the movement of goods and uh, um, what role has the disruption in aviation played and then how how quickly can we can we restart that engine? Laurie, maybe I'll just come to you again first because you were the one that mentioned it earlier. So I don't know if you want to add more to that and then go to our, our airline colleagues. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, we're a trading nation. So that's the, sort of the heart of our country. Um, and I think air cargo and the movement of goods by air is sort of a uh, sort of a bit of a silver lining coming out of the pandemic. I mean, we've seen an increase in cargo movements at Pearson. I mentioned the fact that 70% of cargo is in the underbelly of, of, of passenger aircraft. So there's a good reason why we need to, you know, peel back some of those travel restriction layers and get passenger traffic moving again so we can move that critical cargo. But we saw you know, a doubling of cargo over the course of the pandemic as, you know, the, the key word this pandemic, you know, as, as the industry pivoted to make sure that those essential goods could keep moving and getting to places where they needed to be. You know, vaccines and PPE needed to, needed to keep moving and, and, and they arrived uh, in this country in large part by air. You know, we've seen customers and e-commerce growing and the customer demand for e-commerce growing. Um, so there's capacity in the air cargo world. And so as we look at the challenges we're seeing writ large around supply chains, what role can the air uh, system play to help move goods? I mean, there's some significant advantages about, you know, the resiliency of our sector, you know, the higher security for, you know, the help support the movement of high value goods. Um, IATA's stat I read recently talked about, you know, 80% of our cross-border e-commerce is, is carried by air. Uh, and how do we keep supporting that when the market right now is looking, it's about a $40 billion market growing to 53 billion by 2025. You know, and so we're seeing Pearson playing a stronger role with, you know, business partners like Amazon and Wayfair and FedEx and UPS. Um, and, and so how do we sort of keep supporting the investments that are needed to keep moving that as essential cargo? I've already talked about the need for transit investments to move cargo on our ground side, but what are those smart investments we need to make to keep supporting the movement of goods through cargo 
uh, through air and, and, and investments in digitalization. Um, people want to know where their goods are. They want to know the state of their goods, where they're at, at every sort of moment of the, the journey. And so how do we make sure that those kinds of investments are being made so that we're giving customers what they're looking for in terms of getting the goods that they're seeking? Um, so I think, as I said, it's been a bit, a bit of a silver lining, but also a critical role that aviation has continued to play throughout the pandemic. Just to add, uh, Laurie, on what you have said, and perhaps to a comment earlier made by, uh, by Andy, um, you know, it's difficult to extract some element of travel in general. And this is a, a case in point, you know, when you, when you reduce um, scheduled airline capacity, it has a real impact on cargo because most of the cargo is carried uh, through a scheduled passenger airline. So there are consequences on, you know, travel advisory and closing border that also impact the global supply chain, sorry. And we have experienced that throughout the pandemic. At Air Canada, what we did uh, is that we have increased our cargo division and capacity by operating a dedicated cargo flight. Uh, we have retrofitted, uh, we have uh, changed aircraft, a retrofitted aircraft, so it can carry only cargo. Uh, wide bodies like 777 and 330s. And we have also invested in our facility uh, to develop, for instance, at Pearson, uh, a, um, a, to develop our cold chain handling capability for shipment, such as pharmaceutical, fresh food, and other perishable. So I think, um, you know, cargo is a, an element that is crucial to the global supply chain. It's also important that uh, we, 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 uh, realize that the restrictions that are put on the industry also impact that critical element. I don't know if anyone else wanted to jump in on that one, but I, uh, while you're thinking that, I wanna pick up on something that Laurie talked about as well, and that is that the integration of ground and um, you know, it's not as simple as just aviation. There's, uh, you've all talked about intermodality. I know it's been a key theme that the Board of Trade has been really focused on for a number of years. Um, and it's one of the questions that's come in from, from our audience as well is about that integration, that intermodal integration from both a passenger and a freight side. So um, I don't know if this applies perhaps more to our airport panelists than the airline, but I'll give uh, anyone that wants to jump in on that. I see Jennifer's unmuted. So, you know, how can we, how can we accelerate this process of deeper integration among the different modes of, uh, of travel from both a freight and a passenger perspective? Yeah, no, thanks, Andrew. I, I certainly from a passenger perspective, you know, I think the, the opportunity comes in, in sort of planning for uh, infrastructure investments. I know, for example, there's, there's a significant uh, program that Minister uh, Surma was speaking about earlier related to transit investment in the Ontario line. You know, we certainly would be keen as a downtown city airport to connect into that and think about last last mile connections and and more uh, thinking about that up front and earlier on versus uh, sort of later when the project is is um, sort of more in the, the construction or, or later phases. You know, for us, I think it's really important that we are seen as an integrated mode of transportation to allow the, the ease of movement of our passengers. And I think, you know, one of our advantages being so close to the city is we already see that a number of our passengers, about 40%, either walk, bike, uh, walk, or take our shuttle to access the airport. And I think with increased transit connectivity, uh, you know, that will just continue to uh, improve that, that opportunity for our passengers and also have a, a positive impact for the environment. One of the things I always say is like, people don't travel to airports. As much as I work at one and have for many years and, and love to see airports, that's not their final destination. You know, they're coming here to to do business, they're coming here to visit friends and family, they're coming here to be a tourist and spend money in, in their visitor economy. So they're, they're trying to get somewhere else. So we need to make sure they have an easy way to do that. And so better transit connectivity. I mean, Pearson's a prime example of an airport that really has not had good connections to it. We talked a lot pre-pandemic about the need to have better connections to the airport. I already said, I was really happy to hear the minister talk about the Edmonton Crosstown. Right now it's planned to go you know, just south of the airport, but think about the option and the, the you know, just the prize of connecting that Eglinton Crosstown line to Pearson, connecting it to that large employment zone so that, you know, work, um, businesses can attract talent, people can get to good jobs, we can get people onto transit and have that more sustainable way of moving people. And those connections also help to move our cargo. I mean, we, we, we need that intermodality in terms of how we work with other, uh, other modes. 
and and we just need to unlock some of these investments to start to be smarter about how we're connecting our airports i mean we used to be a country that was connected by rail and we still are to a certain extent but um but we're you know our global connectivity and growing back to, to having those frequencies and connections around the world so our economy can tick along and we can get our goods to market and uh, our investments brought back into this this country and more head office locations to choose. You know, um, Jennifer mentioned preclearance. I mean, that is that huge opportunity for us to continue to leverage that advantage we have to, to, to get people into North America over Toronto and into those markets, but they can make those investments here locally and build those head office corporations given all that Toronto has to offer and still be able to move their people and goods globally and into the, the big US market that we've got. So um, that intermodality is huge um, across the network globally and, and here locally on the ground. I think and, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Andy. I mean, I think integration is improving. I think it was at a uh, Toronto Region Board of Trade Summit, maybe four, five, six years ago, it was Toronto Pearson with the map showing, well, here's where the rail lines go, here's where the subway lines go, here's where the go lines go, and none of it was really properly integrated into what is a global hub <laughs> airport. So I think, you know, the board has done good work here in terms of the importance of that. But um, as an airline, you know, we have to do more around you know, linking ourselves to some of those issues. If you care about affordable transit to and from an airport and in your community, you also, we believe, should be seized with the affordability of air travel and how the federal government treats travelers. If, you know, the more passengers we have arriving at Terminal 3, the more viable Union Pearson Express is, the more viable uh, and the more uh, robust those business cases are to make sure that Lori and her team and Jennifer and their teams when they're building these things, um, you know, have a viable, have viable transit options and that the case is there for those investments. But maybe with one eye on what are the keys to actually get as many people as possible and the best mix of travelers uh, possible in and out of, um, you know, in and out of airports. I mean, we're not Germany, you know, you can't buy a, you know, you can get a Deutsche Bahn ticket from the smallest town in Germany and tag your bag at that small German town for your flight. Like We're not there. That's going to take a while. Uh, right now, we have a rebuild and recovery thing that we need to um, to get our hands around. So if what you mean by sort of that integration is, you know, that Deutsche Bahn uh, fantasy, we're, we're not we're not we are not there in Canada right now. So another question has just come in, picking up on this theme of, of intermodality. So let me stick with that before moving on to a different topic, and that is, uh, with the announcements and some of the investments being made in the rail corridor, the Quebec Windsor Rail Corridor, how does that? How does some of those uh, service augmentations and technological augmentations uh, support, or you know, either challenge or support? What opportunities does that create for improved intermodality on a regional level? I don't know if anyone wants to wants to take that one. I mean, you know, uh, the opportunity, of course, is for I, I don't know. Are we is an integrated ticket experience for customers in our future? Is there is there an opportunity for, uh, you know, the international airports can only be so close together. So there's, you know, does rail fill in? A, what How do we how do we leverage the opportunity of rail to fill in the gaps in between those uh, those places and then use that as, as, as in reverse as kind of the fuel and opportunity to stimulate more demand for travel and stimulate more uh, more international travel to our destination. We've all, often said, as, as a destination, you know, critical mass is so important. We part of the reason we succeed Toronto as a leisure travel destination is because Niagara Falls is nearby, and because Ottawa is only a few hours down the road. And so, when you're flying from from say Beijing, a traveler from Beijing or from from Brazil, they don't just come to Toronto for three days and go home again. They make the region an experience. And so that intermodality becomes not only functionally important, but it actually becomes part of the appeal to the destination in the first place. So, Debbie, go ahead. I let you. Yeah, I would say, uh, and you know, perhaps to uh, repeat what a couple of my colleagues say before, um, each uh, mode of transportation had its role to play to have an efficient transportation network. The question is how we integrate those and how we make it easier for the traveler. The key is connectivity and ease of travel. Uh, you know, people will uh, will 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 go with intermodality to the extent that. It's, um, it's easy, it's simple, 
and you have uh, you know good schedule and good connectivity. So I think uh, that's uh, you know we have partnership with VRI for instance, uh, and you've seen that you know around the world airlines working with railways. But I think the key is really to achieve efficiency together and and provide a simple and easy travel experience to the traveler. And we've seen some good examples. I mean, it, uh, I've heard a stat before that talked about you know, the role that a connection of Up Express uh, has to Pearson to support people, you know, not getting on the 401 in Kingston to drive to catch their flight, but their ability to jump on uh, a via train to get their connection at Union Station to get up to Pearson because you can get ticketed right through uh, mm -hmm. to catch their flight. So, you know, rather than sitting on the 401 in the middle of a snowstorm in February, if you're heading to Fort Lauderdale, um, that kind of connectivity, and you see that uptick in, in, in from the traveler who, as you say, David, is looking for that easy connection that they can make that's seamless, makes sense for their travel needs, and they can get onto the plane and get to where they want to get to, but using the modes of travel that are available to them. So building those stronger rail connections only serve to support better global and national connections from an air, airline and airport perspective. I think they can be helpful for sure and additive. And, you know, I'd echo what, what David and, and Lori said, I guess, you know, airline bias here, guilty. But, um, you know, Calgary Airport in, in 2021 became the third largest airport in Canada for passenger volumes passing Montreal. There is no fixed rail link there. There is no equivalent of Union Pearson Express. What there is is extraordinary airline investment. And there is extraordinary airline investment everywhere. I'm just right. but. You know, the growth and the fact that they have achieved the third largest airport in Canada was not because of a rail link. It was because of airline investment. But do we all have to work together? And is it all stimulative and additive? 100%. So I think maybe there's a distinction between transit rail links, which are essential for citizens to get to and from the airport, which are extraordinarily valuable and in the public good. But there's a bigger issue around how governments policy-wise treat passenger rail travel and travelers and air passenger travelers. And I think that that may meet, that may be an emerging issue. Well, let's just go back for a moment to, uh, to air <laughs> on zone for a moment. And uh, yeah, there's a question that, that's come in about the pace of, of recovery and the opportunity for kind of a surge in, in demand. Um, I won't ask for, I know there are competitive issues here. I, I won't ask for, for forecasts or anything like that, but let me, let me maybe shift the question slightly towards, you know, asking, asking you all to identify, are there markets, either geographic or market segments, you know, elements of business travel and leisure travel, for example, that will be uh, faster and slower to resume. I think some of that we, we've seen, we understand that business travel clearly has been, you know, a, a significant, um, an enormous challenge for our destination. Uh, it's such an important part of our visitor economy here and, and practically evaporated for a period of time and it's gradually starting to restart. But, you know, to, to all of you, are there, are there segments that, um, that look like the tail is going to be much longer or the on-ramp, I should say, is going to be much, uh, much longer to recovery. Jennifer, why don't we, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. And, and I'll sort of talk a little bit about our journey. I mean, we, we were in a bit of a unique situation where uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, commercial operations uh, did get suspended for a period of about 18 months. So it was only this past September where we saw commercial service uh, resume at Billy Bishop. We were very excited about that. And, you know, it, it seemed to be uh, recovering fairly well. I think we got up to nearly 40% of our pre-pandemic uh, sort of traveler levels uh, by December. But then, of course, Omicron hit and, and things went down again. But, you know, what, what we observed in that period of time was that there was a, a strong uh, uptick from the U.S. market, as I mentioned earlier. I think that's where we will continue to, to sort of see the, the rise and the increase and, and the growth. And I think a lot of that, you know, is going to be supported through, you know, lifting of restrictions as well as, you know, the strong vaccination rates in, in both countries and definitely a desire, I think, uh, for travelers, both business and leisure to, to get back at it. Again, uh, just compliment and uh, <clears throat> definitely I agree with you, Jennifer. Um, of course, we see some market recovering faster, all this travel segment, uh, visit friend and relative. 
people want to see their family, especially people who have family in other countries. So this is a market segment that it will recover, is recovering faster. Uh, some area of the world where you have more strict restriction uh, will take more time to recover. I'm thinking about Asia, for instance. But there is something you said, Andrew, in your remark uh, that really struck me because I, I have exactly the same memory. You talk about the first flight you took since the beginning of the pandemic and you remember it. Well, everybody remembers the first flight they took after the pandemic. That means something to us. It means that people miss traveling. I can tell you uh, last year when I flew with the family to go to the Madden Islands, you know, for a weekend and family, my, my kids were super excited. Like if it was the first flight they take. So you can see it from kids. You can see it from business traveler. You can see it from, you know, people that uh, want to see their family. There is an excitement about traveling. People want to be back. And this will drive the recovery of our industry. So we're, of course, very optimistic, but the travel measure needs to evolve to allow people, you know, to get that experience, to see their family and uh, to sustain job in this country. David is so right. I mean, the good news here is that Canadians are way ahead of, of their political leaders on travel. And just look at the summer when advisory was in place, Canadians saw their country, they reunited with their families. They took trips overseas into the United States. So, um, you know, the, the pent up demand is incredible and, and people miss it. Let me go, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up now, but I'm gonna go to each of the panelists very quickly. We'll consider this our lightning round, but here we have hundreds of business and civic leaders from our community in front of us, um, you know, <laughs> sitting in front of us here as we're on the stage. Um, what do you want to say to them? This is your opportunity in front of them. I'll kind of give you the microphone each for, uh, for just a quick moment to, uh, uh, to, to make the ask. How can Toronto's civic and business leadership help support the recovery of our sector? Laurie, maybe we'll start with you. Well, I guess what I would say is what we're thinking about is how do we, how do we make sure we don't get here again? And so how do we have a pandemic playbook or a playbook for whatever, so that the heavy hammer of border closures and restrictions isn't the go-to? Um, I think what we've seen and what we're hearing from organizations like the WHO is that those sorts of restrictions don't work. And so how do we make sure that the business community is standing up and saying that we, we need that playbook, we need a harmonization of rules globally, so that people can travel again, uh, and 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 how do we make sure we have that playbook so that those heavy hammers aren't the go-to for governments again? Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so I would say get back to uh, back to downtown, back to business travel, and uh, certainly be be vocal advocates, as as Lori said. Thank you. No, Andy, go ahead. Uh, one message is thank you, and I'll say that again. Two is, you know, book your corporate business travel for 2022. Even if it's not with WestJet, please do it. Um, and when you do travel, thank the airline, thank the airport worker. Really talk about your experience and how, and how safe it was. That is going to make a difference. Politicians will hear that. And last point, issues around testing. And whether it's this or that or five days or one days are economic issues for the region of Toronto. They are not just nuisances and inconvenience. And we need your continued support and the support of Jan, Andrew and Lindsay and the entire team at the Board of Trade. Thank you for supporting us and our issues. David, over to you. I will just echo what my colleague said uh, first, you know, thanks to everybody on the, uh, on, on the web who is uh, watching us. Um, thank you to our many clients for flying with us even during this, uh, these times. Um, and I would say, like uh, my colleague said, you know, get, a, get that excitement back, you know, go back flying and reinforce the importance of travel to your business, to decision maker, and don't be shy to be vocal about it. Travel is important, not only for the travel industry, but for many key sectors in an economy, in a country like Canada, for which you know trade and export and immigration is so important. So thanks a lot, and you know, looking forward to uh, welcoming you all back on our aircraft. Merci beaucoup.
Thank you all. I'm going to invoke my moderator's prerogative and add my own thought to that one. And that is to say, let's start meeting again. It's time to be booking meetings. And, and for everyone that's planning meetings, booking meetings, let's start with them in Toronto this year. Your visitor economy community, the hospitality sector, the airlines, our airports, our, our restaurants, um, everyone needs it in the community. So one of the ways I think our, our business leadership and civic leadership can show real leadership is by starting to lead by example and holding your meetings in Toronto and inviting people to come to Toronto to meet here in our region. So um, thank you for that. Thank you to our panelists. I uh, appreciate all of your, your thoughts and, and candor this morning. Uh, thanks to the Board of Trade for the opportunity to uh, talk about the aviation industry and the visitor economy and all the related sectors. And with that, I'm happy to turn the floor back to Lindsay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and to get the ball rolling, I booked a flight last night. So uh, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, just a quick thank you to everyone for bringing your insights to today's summit. John Thomas, thank you for kicking us off and sharing not only how you chose Toronto as the region where you see growth, but on your own plans for growth. You and the other panelists uh, pointed to the importance of Toronto having two airports and we at the, board, at the board couldn't agree more. Jennifer, David, Andy and Lori, it was great to have you here and to see many of you again. The aviation powerhouse we have in our region is a huge strength for our future growth, we know this. Andy Gibbons used the word burden to describe the unique restrictions and challenges that aviation carries in terms of opening up. Please know that we are committed to continue to convene discussions like this, as well as advocate on your behalf to ensure the market opens up and thrives. And finally, thank you to Andrew Weir for moderating. It's always a pleasure working with you and Destination Toronto continues to be an important partner. So I'm curious to reflect on your comments on our audience poll. So if we could bring up the results. So we have 23% at fewer than six months, um, a stronghold here for six to 12 months at 30%, 29% um, for one to two years, more than two years, 11%. And I've already resumed business travel uh, at 10%. So we, uh, we absolutely have an opportunity here to uh, educate and provide uh, our audience with a lot of uh, confidence and clarity uh, using, I think, many of the suggestions that this panel uh, presented in terms of how we get travelers back uh, and feeling more comfortable. So uh, thank you very much for, for all your contributions uh, to the audience there.